This week, I came across an article that talked about what is fear. And in that article by Lisa uh, Fritcher, uh, it was medically reviewed, by the way, by Stephen Gans, MD. And she writes this. She said, fear alerts us to the presence of danger or the threat of harm, whether that danger is physical or psychological. Sometimes fear stems from real threats, but it can also originate from imagined dangers. One of the things that uh, I think is very critical for us in these important days is to know the difference between real threat and threats that are perceived or imagined. Now, let me tell you, I do believe that right now what's going on in our country, I do believe that it is a real threat. I do believe that we have taken measures to slow the threat and do all the things we're supposed to do. In fact, I want you to know that as a church, I want to commend uh, all of you, whether at home or here uh, in, in, in person today, for following what they've said to do. There are some wonderful things about following Romans uh, 13, talking about listening to the government and doing what they say to do. And here's the thing, if I thought that the government was trying to do this to to suppress our faith or to uh, persecute the faith, then I would uh, probably be taking somewhat of a different approach. However, there are some things that would suggest, even in our local, uh, uh, our locale here in San Antonio, that there are some things where people have practiced a little overreach. I praise God it's not as much as many parts of the country where they basically said church is not essential at all, and anybody who opens uh, church, uh, especially in New York City, uh, that church will, they'll do everything in the city's power to close that church indefinitely. And so I do think there's some overreach in some of this, but I thank God for our governor. I thank God for the common sense that he has exhibited in all of this that allows us to come and worship and that worship is seen as essential rather than something that is a byproduct of uh, faith. So fear is important, and I want you to know that it's important that you get that and understand that. Uh, I don't want to dismiss it, but I also want to try and bring clarity to it. One of the things about it is you, as you think about it, it's important to human emotion. It can help protect you from danger, and it can prepare you to take action. You've heard me preach the message on fight or flight, and that uh, uh, takes place when our body kicks in, and emotionally, uh, there's one of three things we're going to do, and two of them are natural, and one of them is a learned behavior. The two that are natural is to run or to fight. Okay, and some of you have experienced this during this whole time. What should I do? Should I do this or should I do that? Sometimes it's run, sometimes it's fight, whatever the case may be. But I hope that we've taken the ground that God has called us to take, and that is very simply that we reason it out from the perspective of God's Word. That we look at all that's going on around us and see, is this a fear that's going to cause us to change our faith? Is this a fear that's going to cause us to run with our, like our hair's on fire, screaming down the hallways? What is this fear going to accomplish in us? And so as I, I looked at this article, a few things came out. And, and I want you to know, fear not only can be good, but it can also create anxiety. Can I get an amen? So with that, the Lord tells us not to be anxious, but fears drive our actions. Think about that for just a moment. But I'm not going to go with the fear of getting COVID or the fear of of dying. I'm going to go with three other fears, maybe lesser known, but think about it deep inside of you because I could speak about the fears that are present and everybody go, amen. But let me speak about the fears that oftentimes are not so much expressed as, as they have been in these days. How about the fear of being the brunt of a joke? How about the fear of being watched? How about the fear of losing something or someone? I have to tell you, those are all just as, fear, as, as real as, as the COVID-19, and they all can have an impact on our life. These fears, whether they're being the brunt of a joke or whether they're the COVID-19 virus, whatever, they have uh, an impact of uncertainty in our lives. Uncertainty can generate a fear of social interaction. 
Uncertainty can generate a fear of loving. There are people out in the world who want nothing to do with love because they've been hurt in the past. And therefore, they don't want to experience and don't believe they can experience being loved ever again. Uncertainty can generate a fear of acting, of doing something. Have you ever heard of somebody being frozen and just they couldn't do anything? Uncertainty can generate a fear of living. And I think that's more in line with where we are in our world today, a fear of living. So how do you deal with fear? Well, I took some of the approaches that Lisa had written about in her article, and, and I just shortened them for the purpose of being able to share these with you. But I also added some things, so I have to let you know that this is some of her intellectual property as well as some of mine, and I want you to know that. And right now, I'm going to say this is, is, is ours, but it's, it's kind of mine, hers. I don't, I don't know exactly how to put it because I've preached this sermon on many different occasions and uh, many different ways, and, and all of these things are things I've shared with you. So as I say the things I've shared with you before, please say amen so that you understand I'm not stealing her stuff. I said it long before she put it on, a, on paper. Is that fair enough? First of all, how do we deal with our fears? Well, there's a systematic approach. This one, many of you are going to love, and you're going to argue with me later, and, and, and it's okay. I still love you. But it's proven, and it's a fact that this actually works. In this treatment, you gradually lead through, you're led through a series of exposure situations. For example, fear of snakes. I knew that would get every one of you. Fear of snakes. It's interesting that every time there's a snake on the property, it's always a rattlesnake. It always is. I can be green. It can be black with, with yellow stripes. It can be just almost anything, but it's a rattlesnake. It can have a rounded head, not a viper head or an a, a, a arrow-shaped head, but it's a rattlesnake. And I have to tell you, that troubles my heart. Uh, while many of you would believe there is no snake that's good except a dead snake. Believe it, or God, uh, believe it or not, God created snakes, and even though that was the, the uh, conveyor in the beginning of, of what seems to be uh, the original sin and, and everything like that, the reality of it is, believe it or not, there are some snakes that are good. And of course, if you didn't hear it at home, somebody said, dead snake. I got it. Well, here's the way you start by, uh, to overcome these things is, first of all, you sit down and open a dialogue about snakes. This is, a, this is one of the approaches to dealing with fear. You sit down and start a dialect or a dialogue about the very thing that brings you fear. You start looking at any uh, advantages there are. You start looking at what the purpose is in the environment and what God created them to do and all of those kind of things. And as you look at those things, you begin to realize that all snakes are not poisonous and going to kill you if you touch them. Now, some of you are going, okay, you lost me right there, Pastor. I got it, because you have a fear that doesn't matter what anybody does, you are going to hold on to that fear and ignore anything about any benefit that's there. Well, I want you to know that this is just a method that they use, and if you choose not to use it, then you're going to continue with your fear, and all God's people said, shame on you. So we look at how they're positive or how they're beneficial. We look at the impact that they have. And then we determine if they're a snake that we want to keep. How many of you like rats? You know, there's some snakes that kill rats. Hmm. That aren't poisonous. The key to it is once you become informed about anything, the better you're able to handle your fear. So for those of you who want to stay in your fear, you will always have a fear of snakes. But when you start looking and saying, wait a minute, that's one that I want to keep around, especially if I have a rat problem. Some of you would say, just get a cat. Well, you wouldn't have to worry about the snake. Cat will kill the snake. 
and the rats. So you're saying, so what's the purpose of the snake, Pastor? I, I know that you can use all kind of logic here and all kind of foolishness here, but the reality of it is there are some out there that are good. So the second thing they would do is over time, you might start taking a look at the pictures of snakes so that you'd be better able to identify. Remember earlier I told you that every snake that's ever been on this property is a rattlesnake. There's only one time that I've seen a rattlesnake on this property in 20 years. And there were two of them. And they were about that long. And they were right over there in the rocks between the, the old sanctuary and that sidewalk. Now some of you for the rest of your life will fear walking down that sidewalk. 20 years, I saw two of them. Oh, but Brother Jack, where there's one, there's got to be more. Well, there was. There was two. And I'll never forget, I, I, uh, my secretary, um, it, it, it wasn't my administrative assistant. Notice I made that delineation. My secretary, when he heard that there was two rattlesnakes out there, he said, don't hurt them. I got to tell you, poisonous snake, close to kids, you kill it. Done. I'm good. So I had taken, I had a, a, a nail pulling bar, and I had basically cut the head off of one of them. And the other one, he moved, and I missed him. And he, 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 I got him right in the middle of his body, and my secretary walked out and said, no, 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 don't hurt that baby snake. And he reached down there, and he started to pick up that snake. And I thought of Mark, the book of Mark. It talks about handling snakes and everything like that. I was, well, maybe this is the day. <laughs> and I told him, I said, hey, Dan, you're grabbing for the business end of that thing. You know, there's the tail that was on one side of the crowbar, and there was a head. And he, he reached down there, and pretty soon he went, ooh, got him. Right there on that middle finger. But he was persistent. He reached back down there and pulled that thing out and grabbed it by the head and he took it out and put it in that field so it could die or be eaten by the birds out there. I don't know which, but he took it out there as if he was doing some kind of compassionate thing. But I have to tell you, for four days, he never went to the hospital. For four days, that man sat and he typed. He couldn't even use his other hand because it was so swollen. But he wasn't going to go to the doctor, and I remember there was a place on it that even opened up because of the swelling was so bad. Now, I have to tell you something, folks. That's the only experience we've had with the rattlesnake. And if we ever had another one, I will tell you, don't touch the business end of the snake. Okay? I'll be the first to go out and help you kill the thing. But I have to tell you, I don't want to get rid of some of the garden snakes, and I don't want to get rid of some of the other snakes that are beneficial. But if I didn't know the difference, I knew from the minute I saw it, it was a rattlesnake. Why? Because I've been informed about snakes. I've looked at pictures, and that's the second thing you do, is you wind up looking at things so that you're able to identify what's a threat, what to be fearful of, and what not to be fearful of. <laughs> so, you begin to look at snakes and their pictures and be able to identify, to identify them. And then... When you're able to identify the various snakes, then maybe you start playing with a little rubber snake. Put it under somebody's pillow. Something like that. I know in my house that would probably culminate in my passing, but, uh, but you take that and you determine the fear factor and that differentiates between accommodation and real fear, things you should be fearful of. So, I get it. You're focused on the fear of snakes. Nothing is going to change that. That is impossible. No, it's improbable. Let's make sure we call it what it is. It's improbable that you will change uh, your thoughts on snakes, but I still had to go there because that's the systematic approach. You're unwilling to learn and apply new coping techniques to manage your fear response about snakes. But apply that to other areas of your life. And then, 
maybe you can apply that uh, systematic approach. The second approach was the flooding approach. It's based upon the premise that a phobia is learned behavior and you need to unlearn it. Okay? That's the premise. You need to unlearn it. In the flooding approach, you are exposed to the object of your fear for a prolonged amount of time. It's kind of like when Indiana Jones was laying in that thing and it was full of snakes. Yeah, that's the kind of thing. In fact, the Schick method back in the 70s, what they would do is anything that they wanted to, to break in your habits, for example, smoking or something like that, they would have you sit down and smoke continuously with three or four or five cigarettes in your mouth at one time. And you just smoked and smoked and smoked until you came to a point where you said, I hate this, and you never wanted to smoke again. So the flooding method of dealing with your fears is also one of the things that you can do. You begin to identify potential panic until your fear begins to diminish. Note, this should be done in a safe, controlled environment. Don't do it because Brother Jack said it works. Trained professionals are a good place to go for this. Confront your fears, and over time, you begin to overcome your anxieties, realizing that you're still okay. I went to Astroworld in Houston. I don't know if it's still open or not, but they had a, a roller coaster there, and it was the thrill of a lifetime. Um, I rode it many years later, and, and it wasn't as thrilling as it was then because everybody said, oh, it's so dangerous, and the back car comes off the track, and it did. You could watch it from down there standing in line. A lot of things to fear about the cyclone. When I was in high school, I, I had a fear of roller coasters to some degree, and I just wanted to prove to the girls I didn't want to look bad. I had the fear of looking bad. I didn't want to look bad to the girls and stuff like that. So I decided I'm going to overcome my fear of that roller coaster. I rode it 37 times in one day. And now I'm like, yeah, roller coasters. Yeah, but now I've got a heart thing. And so this is kind of like, no, 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 you've got a heart thing now. And I'm like... I did all of that, and I lose out. But I remember trying to get my boys to ride on a roller coaster. Come on, guys, you just got to give it a try. Get on it and see if you enjoy it, you know. See what happens. Thousands of people ride these things every day. And, you know, that's one of the, the real things that we can look at about the flooding method. Look at all of the people who do this every day and are okay. My son, I'll never forget, he wrote me a letter. He was in the, uh, right below the catapult, catapult on the USS Carl Vinson, an aircraft carrier, and he was right below it, and he had been out there for about five days, and he sent me this heartbreaking uh, email. Dad, I can't stand this. This is impossible. No one can, and no one could bear this and, and everything. And I said, son, thousands of guys have slept in the same place you're sleeping, and guess what? They're still alive able to tell the tale. Now, son, just suck it up and, and keep going. To which my counsel did not receive a very nice response. But the flooding method says, hey, there's other people. It's going to be okay. You know, one of the things that we keep hearing about all that's going around, it's going to be okay. And, you know, I believe that not because they tell me it is, but because God is still God and he's still on his throne. He has not relinquished one ounce or one speck of his sovereignty in all of that. So, we see this. The third method is the coping method. And basically, surrounding yourself with people that are going to encourage you, which you, one of the things that we do in church, we're supposed to, and the Bible tells us, to be an encouragement to one another, spurring one another on to uh, the things God has called us to do. And so uh, we look at it, and, and so social support comes in this, uh, stress management, like deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and, and all of these different things. And you know what? I would say just get you a squeezy ball. They work really good. Um, Put it in this hand for a while. Just relieve your tension. There are many different ways you can relieve your tension. I, I, I tell you that. And so coping skills, your, your, your pretty place that you go to whenever things aren't going well, all those kind of things. And so there's the coping method. The final thing of the coping method, though, is one I tell people all the time when I'm in the hospital and they've got a loved one in the hospital, and that is take care of you. Eat, sleep, 
Do what you need to do. They're in a place where they're being taken care of. Right now, take care of yourself because there will be a time that you have to take care of your loved one when they come home. But be prepared to do that by not being exhausted from doing what doctors and nurses and everything like that are able to do. So, those are three of the worldly approaches to take a look at. And all three of them can be incorporated into what I'm about to share with you in this message. I know this has been a long introduction, but just wait. The message is even longer. What would you say if I said, take all of these things and let them augment, not be the basis for, but augment a biblical approach to fear? Something that you can use as tangible things. God's Word is enough. I get that. But the reality of it is what they're saying is true things. These things actually come to fruition and take place and people have overcome certain things in their life by using these three methods. But what if we took a biblical approach to these things? When fear grips your life, have you ever thought about speaking the truth of God's word into the situation? Here's the problem with that, though. You've got to know enough of God's Word to be able to speak it in there. And this is one of the reasons why I encourage you with everything that's in me, don't just talk about God's Word. Know God's Word. In this, we can see the importance of knowing His Word. Because in His Word, we find things that bring confidence. In the midst of fear, don't we need to have confidence? To know that we'll get through this, that we'll get by it, it goes to that, that second method. It goes to the second, second method, the flooding method. Flood our lives with the things that God has already said. For example, in fact, somebody gave this to me the other day, not because I didn't know it, but because they shared with me, every time they start getting scared, they quote this verse, and I love it, it's Deuteronomy 31.8. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you, he will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not be afraid or do not fear or be dismayed. This is what Moses was saying to Joshua about what God had said to him. And Moses lived what he just told Joshua. And when I look at that passage, it's still a very valid passage for our world today. Think about it, folks. The, one, the Lord is the one that goes ahead of you. Why, why do we know that? Because He is omniscient about everything you will face. He's omnipresent. He's there with you when you face it. So the Lord is the one who goes ahead of you and with you. He will be with you in that next part. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Isn't that a wonderful passage? Think about that if we were to speak that into what's going on in our world right now. Speak that not just because we're we're uh, doing an incantation of Scripture, but because it has a meaning to us. We are people of faith, and you know, I can't share share this message of hope and faith with a lost world who doesn't want to see anything but the things of the world. This is why we have to live our faith, and the best way to live our faith is to be able to take our faith and use it in a way that brings glory to God. And yes, we're going to be coming around to those passages in just a few moments. How about he's our companion? Not only is he our confidence, he's also our companion. Jesus says this in John 14, 27. He says this to his followers. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Why? Because he's right there with us. Don't let our hearts be troubled. Think about speaking that when you're sitting there watching the 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock news. Think about speaking that into your brain. Because I know there's enough out there to tell you fear this, fear that, fear everything that's out there. Do this, do that. And I have a feeling in the days ahead as things begin to lift 
And as things begin to change and maybe get back to a, maybe a new normal, but a little bit more normal, we'll see these things and we'll wonder, why didn't I look at that first? Why didn't I put that in my head when they were telling me two million, three million people in the United States might die? Why didn't I put that into my head and say, wait a minute, God's Word says He's my companion. He walks with me through all of this. He's also there to bring me confidence. He does so much for us And yet so often we dismiss him in troubled times. Not only is he our confidence, he's our companion, he is also our compass. The psalmist writes in Psalm 27, 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Both very critical and important things for you and I to pay attention to him. Whom shall I fear? If he's guiding me and he's leading me, and I know he's the one that saves me, if I know all of these things, who is it out there that I should fear? And I would hope and pray that you would consider that. What is there out there to fear that's bigger than the God who says, I love you, who is my guidance and the only one who can save me? Now, I realize from an Old Testament perspective, they didn't have the understanding of Christ on the cross and the salvation we understand, but I guarantee you David understood it because he lived all through everything Saul was doing to him and God watched over him in all of it. So I think it's applicable for today as well as then. But how about Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6? Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? You see, we have to have a compass within us that says this is the right way for us to go. And right now, our compasses are kind of messed up. And, and you know, I think it's kind of like Jack Sparrow's compass. If you remember the Pirates of the Caribbean, and I don't know if I've just broken law by mentioning a a copyrighted name or not, but his compass, what was so unique and intriguing was it didn't point north. In fact, the British, when they got it, they said, he's even got a worthless compass. They throw it down and say it doesn't even point north. But he had a compass that pointed to whatever he wanted. And that was the key to that compass. So he's like, okay, fine, throw it down. It's a wordless compass. Give it back to me. I like a compass that doesn't read the right thing. But so often we have a compass, and our compass is set for us to find whatever we want. But the Bible teaches us we should be seeking and using God's compass that's always going to point back to Him, to His work, to His mission, to who He is. So, we see that he is our confidence, our companion, our compass, and he's also our glory. There's none of us that deserve any glory at all. In fact, God says, I don't share with anybody. He's our glory. If we have anything to boast on or brag about or anything like that, it ought to be who we serve, who he is. That's where our bragging and boasting should be in our confidence as our companion, as our compass, our glory should be seen not in what we can do, but in what He does through us. So, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you, if you would, we're going to do a little calisthenics real quick, all right? At home, I hope you'll just join us. Stand with me for the reading of God's Word. In heaven, they recognize that he deserves every bit of the glory. None reserved for anything in heaven or on earth except God. It says in Revelation 4.11, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created leading us to a response in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 
And then he gives us a passage of confidence, and it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Father, we thank you for these passages. And Father, we don't recite them as some kind of power prayer or power verse. We recite them because it reminds us that it's about your glory. It's about the greatness of who you are. It's about us showing forth your glory, your greatness, not for ourselves, but for you. We thank you for that wonderful responsibility. And Father, we praise the awesomeness of who you are. We thank you. Now, Father, be with the rest of this message, and I pray, Lord, that as you do, that you'll speak to our hearts. Help us to think of ways where we can go out and serve you even better, even in the midst of all the fear, even in the midst of all the uncertainty. Lord, give us a confidence in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. When we look at his glory... It takes us to the questions that we've asked now for these many, many weeks, and we will continue to ask these questions. And the reason we are is because I have heard from some of you that, uh, hey, it helps to be reminded each week of these things just so that when we go out, we understand what our mission really is. I'll give you an example. Brother John has been speaking about who's your one, and and I have to tell you that as John has stood up and talked about who's your one, what thrilled my heart and my soul was I didn't have to go tell the head head of our deacons, hey, John, you need to do this. And then John said, okay, Pastor, if that's what you want me to do. He did that last Sunday all of his own volition. Believe it or not, Brother Jack had nothing to do with it. And then this morning, as we were standing out in the hallway, we had another brother share with us that it's working because he's been praying for a guy who's been practicing Jehovah's Witness, uh, practicing Jehovah's Witness for several years, and he's making some inroads into his life because he's been praying for them. I have to tell you, the power of prayer still works. And when you focus it in the direction of those that are lost, God will always bless that because he desires that no one... No one should go to hell, but all would be saved. But they have to be saved through Jesus Christ as the Father draws them. So, these questions are here to make us think. What does God's love mean to you? What does it mean to me? Wow. You see, if he's my companion, I ought to be getting closer to him. You know, one of the things about it, and I, I, I don't like using my wife for an example, but I'm going to today. This is a good example, so I'll be able to have lunch today. <laughs> the longer I'm with her, the more I know about her. I know what pushes her buttons, and all you men should say, and I know the things that make her pleased. All of these things, and it's, it's wonderful. And the longer you know someone, the more you love them, not because of whatever the foundation was you started off on. Some people are still at the fact he saved me. Let me tell you something. Every day he wants you to fall in love with him even more. So what does his love mean to you? Secondly, what have I really searched out about him, about God this week? We know he first loved us, but what have we found this week? about his love. The third question, am I becoming more or am I willing to make real changes in the secret places of my life? I'm not even going to say anything about that. But you know those places where you harbor anger, selfishness, loneliness, and your anxiety. And finally, am I becoming more proactive with my emotions, managing unpredictable situations to the glory of God? For those of you who are watching us uh, and those of you who are here today who may be guests, I was saying this before COVID ever came along. So it wasn't something I, I created as a novelty. God gave this to me months before. And we've been asking this question for a long time. But notice what it says. I'm becoming more proactive with my emotions, managing unpredictable situations to the glory of God. Wow, what a question for right now, today. So these are all things that help us to be able to move forward. So I want to take you over to a biblical example for just a minute if I could. I want to take you over to Daniel chapter 6. 
we're going to be looking at a, a large group of verses, but we're going to do it in a very timely way. So I'll not be reading all of this, and I'm going to be uh, giving a narrative on this story along with the passages that are here. King Darius had just come in, and by the way, isn't it great, the sound effects? By the way, for those of you at home, that's not somebody's phone. That is actually birds living up there. So God's just kind of helping sing along, and uh, so uh, we love that. So with that in mind, King Darius has just come to power in uh, Babylon. Uh, The Babylonians have been defeated by the Medes and the Persians, and King Darius comes in, and as King Darius is there, he, he likes Daniel and his three friends. He likes them because apparently they do their work well. And, and they're looking to be team players in all of this. And, and, of course, that created and generated some animosity between other leaders that didn't particularly care for Daniel. So they wanted to find a way to entrap Daniel. And they, they come up with this, this idea in verse 7. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governor had consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man Beside you, O king, for thirty days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now they had an ulterior motive in this because they knew every day Daniel was going to be praying. Let me tell you, do people know you well enough about your faith to know that every day you're going to be doing this? You know, more and more people I've found have stopped answering their phone during meals. They said, no, it's an important time for us to just put the phones down, not worry about who's texting, not worry about the phone calls. And you know, here's the thing about it. The more people do that, the more it trains everybody else to stop calling during mealtime. It's a wonderful thing. In other words, we prioritized it and we said, hey, this is important to me. Don't bother me during this time. How many of us are known for our prayer life that way? Or do we just catch prayer along the way every day? You know, it's, there's nothing wrong. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. Don't stop. Amen and amen again. But do people know you well enough to be able to say, hey, I know that they're praying right now, and so I'm going to leave them alone while they pray. It's always interesting that, Leanne, what is the day that the church office is closed? Friday. Friday. You know, all week long, my phone won't ring. Friday? All day. Leanne will testify that she knows. Okay, folks, let's say it together. The office is closed on Friday. Did you catch that? Okay, good. It's closed on Friday. But that seems to be the day that everybody says, oh, wait a minute, I'll call. And 90% of the time, it's something that could be dealt with on Saturday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. But Satan loves to steal away time. And I'm not calling you Satan, but don't be his advocate either. But here's the thing. That's the day that I take off to spend with my wife and do the things I need to take care of at home. Real simple. And after 20 years, we still have people that don't get that. How long have we had Friday off? Yeah, 20 years. (laughs) But here's the thing. We need to be training people about our lives so that they understand. I'm not griping about you calling on Friday. By the way, somebody's going to call and say, Oh, Pastor, please, I'm so sorry. I have to call you on Friday. Somebody died. Well, do me a favor. Somebody dies, call me. Friday's okay. But if you're calling to say, Hey, uh, you know, I had a flat tire. I got it fixed and just wanted to call and check on you. My son does that to me every day. I love him dearly. But he calls me every day. And, And if Kim answers the phone, he'll say, Where's Dad? She'll say, well, he's right here. Well, I need to talk to him. She hands me the phone and says, he needs to talk to you. I say, hey, son, what's up? Oh, nothing. <laughs> okay, son, well, where are you going today? And he'll tell me, and I'll say, okay. We'll sit there for a few moments of awkward silenceness, and he'll say, all right, Dad, well, I'll talk to you later. Okay. You would think there was some kind of issue with blood. You know, or some kind of wreck or some kind of hazardous, tor- terrible thing is taking place. But it's just, hey, just checking in. Sometimes I get calls like that on Fridays. And again, I'm using this for illustration purposes. So use your better judgment on when to call and when not to call. But if you're calling just to check on your pastor, just text me. I get texts too. 
Hey, Pastor, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. But the reality of it is we do these kind of things and we don't think about the impact that it has on other people's lives and our lives should be a picture of what we think is important. Our lives should be lived in such a way that the world says, wait a minute, they're praying right now or they're doing this right now. There's something about what's going on that's a priority to them. And I really believe that as Christians, we need to be living in such a way as Daniel was living. And think about it. They knew he prayed three times a day. And he did it openly. It wasn't something that he hid. And I realize people would argue, well, go into your prayer closet and everything like that. I don't think Daniel was praying out that window toward Jerusalem because he was trying to get anybody's attention. I think he was doing it because he was pure in heart about his prayer toward his God. With all my heart, I believe that. He wasn't doing it as insurrection to the government. When he continued to do it, the story tells us, when he continued to do it, he wasn't doing it saying, well, I don't care what the king said. I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, there's some churches out there doing that today. They've told us we can't do this and we can't do that. Let me tell you something. I really believe with all of my heart we need to set that ideal aside and say, wait a minute, what is going to be best to honor God right now? If they were saying close the church, in fact, John MacArthur said this this last week in one of his interviews, he said, you know, if they were persecuting or trying to close the church, now I believe some of that's going on around our, our nation, but I also believe that if that is, then deal with that, but when they're not trying to close the churches and not trying to, to, to do things to persecute Christians, then just do what we can do, but we still must continue to honor God in what we do. But I think we can d- accomplish both. God didn't call us just to be insurrectionists about everything we can. That's man's idea, not God's. So, we see that Daniel doesn't say, well, I'm going to continue to pray. He doesn't get a rally together and tell everybody, hey, the government's trying to take my right to pray away and all those other kind of things. Let's rally together. You know what Daniel did? He continued consistently to do what he'd always done. Now, right now is a wonderful time to start some new things in your life. Being consistent about the things of God. You know one of the reasons we send kids off to camp? Because for one week, they are regimented into Bible study times at certain times of the day with groups and by themselves so that when they go home, they have had five days or six days of this practice and they're hoping that it takes hold and they continue to do it the rest of their life. It's about developing some patterns. It's about saying, this is when I'm going to be doing this, not for the purpose of being able to say I'm doing it now, but for the purpose of being able to say, this is a priority in my life. Right now, you would think that the priority is fear. I would say change that priority. I would say change it to the glory of God, to things that glorify God. So he didn't stand up and he didn't uh, try to create insurrection or anything like that. And so they come back to the king after he puts this into law and and it speaks about the law of the Medes and the Persians in verses 12, 13. And and then in 13 it says, Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. See, they made it about not paying attention to the king when it had nothing to do with not paying attention to the king. It had everything to do with paying attention to God and to giving, giving proper glory and proper due to God. And you notice, here's the thing, for those who would try and do damage to the kingdom work and those who would try and do damage to Daniel, they caught the king in a very precarious situation and the king didn't even like what he had to do, but because it was written into law, and this would suggest that the government wasn't trying to get rid of Daniel's God, but that the government had been duped into believing that this was something that would be beneficial in their system, and then the king had great regrets. In fact, in verse 14, it says this, then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed. That wasn't his intent. His intent was not to crush Daniel or the worship that he had and the devotion for his God. Then he set his mind on delivering Daniel. I love that. But there was no way he could get around 
the law. And so here's what he does in a nutshell. He does what the law says to do, and he puts Daniel in the lion's den, puts a rock over the thing, and then he puts a signet ring on it, sealing it, saying that, hey, he has to stay there overnight. But the king couldn't sleep. The king couldn't sleep. But before, before Daniel went in, the king spoke this in verse 16 in the latter part of it. In fact, we can read 16. Then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. A king that had multiple gods, polytheistic, is saying, I believe your God can do this. You've been consistent with him and I believe he'll be consistent with you. What a testimony. And right now in our world today, the world needs to see Christians not running around in the fear that we talked about earlier, trying to deal with all our fears in certain ways and, and everything like that. But the world needs to see us responding to all of this with a confidence in God that he's going to see us through. And when we respond in confidence, guess what? The world is going to see our confidence that acknowledge the greatness of our God. Think about that for a minute. Whether they follow him or not, there are many times that Nebuchadnezzar said, man, they've got a great God. In fact, King Darius is going to say this when this is all over with. I'll let you read the story on that. But Daniel, because of his faithfulness, the king spoke and was able to say, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. The king had the confidence that every Christian should be living in so that the world can say, I know about your God. I know he's able. So it was laid. Everything is set. Verse 19, it picks up, Then the king arose at dawn at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. Man's been up all night long. With a troubled voice. Hmm. King spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, and notice now he has his question, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Don't know if the stone had been uh, completely taken away or what, but hey, Daniel, are you okay down there? Did your God protect you? Everything suggested to the king that he could put it in this God's hands and this God could take care of him. Daniel, did, did your God do this? And I love Daniel's response. Then Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. Now, I could preach all sorts of sermons off of that verse all by itself. But Daniel then says, God sent his angels, closed the mouths of the lion, lions, and that he was okay. The king pulled him out with great joy. The king pulled him out with great joy. Now let me make some real quick applications and I'll close this message. Right now, the world needs to see the people of God and their faith. Not operating foolishly, but operating in his companionship, in his confidence. Him is our compass, and we need to be doing it all to the glory of God. There's no doubt when I read Daniel's story that all of those things were present in Daniel's life. Now the question is, how present are they in our lives today? I've shared with you those four things, but I would also suggest to you, what are some things that you can be doing right now to be living to the glory of God? You know, I wish I could say, here, let me answer all those questions for you. And some people would try. But I realize that in all my endeavors and all my attempts to tell you how you need to live your life, I could be guiding you down a wrong path. But I know that when you seek the counsel of God and seek the counsel of His Word, I know that you'll never go down a wrong path. But it's when you make your mind up to say, I'm going to live and do what God says. I'm going to live in the confidence He gives me. I'm going to live with Him as my companion. I'm going to live to His glory. 
I'm going to live with him as my compass. So, in a world that needs to see strong faith, they need to see not foolishness, not fear, but faith. May I encourage you this week to go out and to live in the faith that God is able in all things. I remind you this constantly. God wasn't surprised by the COVID virus. He's not up in heaven wringing his hands saying, oh my goodness, what has happened? If you believe that, any part of that, God stopped being sovereign. But according to his word, there's never a time that he's not sovereign. He is always, regardless of what you say or I say, God is sovereign. And because of that, he can be our confidence. He can be our companion, our compass, and our glory. Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you for the opportunity of sharing this message. I pray in these moments that you would use it to your honor and your glory. Lord, as we open this invitation, Lord, we recognize it's not an invitation to the greatness of this pastor, but an invitation for people to respond to what you're speaking into their heart right now. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to live our lives in such a way that the world would stand up and take notice, not of us, but of the greatness of who you are. Father, I realize we've got to overcome our fear. There's things we need to identify, things we, that we need to uh, address with confidence and things that we need to uh, run from. But, Father, most of all, may the world see us running toward you. When we don't understand, when our fears uh, overcome us, may we always look back to you. Father, help us to live that so that the world can see that. We thank you for all you do. Use this time of invitation now to your honor and your glory. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As I do for the